Welcome to the Subspace Exploration Project, a personal journey into kink, non-monogamy, mental and emotional health, gender expression, and building community. In this episode, we had a great talk with our friend Nate Lundeen about how community, social, and political structures directly impact our health, happiness, and safety. Let's jump into our talk with Nate. My name is Nathaniel Lundeen. I am a somatic practitioner. I teach uh, yoga for an, a, a, an, insti- an institution, institution of higher education, if you can believe that. They pay me less than minimum wage. Oh, wow. I am also probably at this point a diversity token in my department, which affords me some job security. <laughs> oh, good. You know an awful lot about psychology. I don't know about an reason. awful lot. It's my undergrad. Mm-hmm. I got my BS in psychology. It wasn't a bad education. There are some shittier mm-hmm. psychology degrees out there. Psych kind of has this reputation for being one of those things you do when you don't know what you want to do. And uh, a lot of uh, a lot of departments will crank out some really shitty psych degrees. But if you're careful, <laughs> you can piece something together that's legit. So I, I sent you some some papers mm-hmm. that Ronan had actually sent me. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had a chance to look those over. I did. I didn't examine the design of the study. Mm-hmm. I'm not really, like, interested. <laughs> yeah. It'll be peer reviewed if it's not already. If somebody finds problems with the design, they can do that. I don't give a shit. But mm-hmm. I can't say I'm surprised. I mean, um, I'm I'm surprised they got funding for that because like nobody mm-hmm. gives a shit. Yeah. It's actively, you know, it actively challenges the status quo, and you know, these institutions don't particularly like to give money to that sort of thing. So I'm sort of surprised that someone got a grant to do that study. Good on them. Mm-hmm. Good job. Uh, yeah, and I can't say that any of the findings are particularly surprising. Now, oh, this is another one of those like correlation does not equal causation situations. So we don't know what the causal factors are or what direction this is in but i mean if you're <clears throat> we're, we're talking about you know being non-neurotypical in one way why would it be odd for you to also be non-neurotypical in another and mm-hmm. if you know if if you're in a situation where you're forced to do a bunch of soul searching and questioning in order to be able to fit into the society that you live in, I don't see why you wouldn't do that in multiple areas of your life. It just trains you to think that way. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. I I thought it was great. I'm really glad somebody ran that study. It's awesome. Do mm-hmm. more. Do more. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, you know, I read. Um, there's one I have. A little bit here. I don't know if it came from one of those articles. Um, it may have come from a different one, but it says studies suggest that individuals with gender and sexual identities outside the binary were also three to six times more likely to also be on the autism spectrum. And also, um, there were higher rates of OCD and ADHD with um, gender divergent, you know, individuals. So, like you said, it's not really surprising. I mean, that sounds kind of like a... What was it? The anxiety and the OCD and also being on the autism spectrum. Those kind of sound like like comorbidities that often occur with each other. I don't know how often, but they would seem more directly linked to each other than one's gender identity i'm gonna call the anxiety etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, uh yeah. a symptom of like s- societal Existing pressure more than anything outside else. the binary the binary mm-hmm. society <laughs> causes anxiety <laughs> yeah right shocking but the, the, the foundation of this talk uh i was hoping would be to kind of dig in and 
non trans non non binary people understand what gender dysphoria is and what it might look like and what other what other types of experiences might be similar to dysphoria um, because I mean it's a very real substantial thing those especially on the right that don't have any comprehension of what it is they just dismiss it as you know it's just a it's just a word but it clearly impacts people in a substantial way and I was hoping that maybe you could start by describing what dysphoria is and and maybe is there a question point to other ex- yeah <laughs> <laughs> well can, can you help define what gender dysphoria is I mean, we can start, we can dance around it. The thing is, like, it's a really difficult thing to pin down even when you're experiencing it. Like, a lot of people struggle Mm -hmm. their entire lives to identify that feeling. And, um, you know, that makes it really difficult to have that discussion, Uh, especially with people who do not experience that in any way. Like, how, how do you really tell someone who's never seen the color red what the color red is? Um, and, and, you know, we all have, there, there's some overlap in everyone's experience, but then there's like the individual, uh, expressions of this stuff and, and, and how it comes out in our behavior, uh, especially when we're not entirely self-aware, but, um, I mean, the, the, there are forms of dysphoria that, that, cis and non like uh non con- non non conforming people also experience you know like there's mm-hmm. a lot of folks running around out there who have really serious problems just presenting in their own skin and those people can probably relate to a certain degree, uh, especially people with um, dysmorphic disorders. I'm not sure how disordery that is, just like I'm not sure how disordery transness is. But like if mm-hmm. there is some part of your body that makes you so deeply uncomfortable that you can't present yourself to the rest of the world, it doesn't really matter whether it's visible or not. That's, that, that feeling mm-hmm. is crippling. And a lot of people with, you know, who experience this do end up doing something about it medically if there is something to be done about it medically. So I'm not even really sure, like, why it's so hard to wrap your brain around. Honey. (laughs) (laughs) She just got it. Please explain to her. Mm, It's fine. (laughs) No, I mean she very much gets it. She knows oh, she's exactly. she's a trans ally. <laughs> and I mean it's it, it it's pretty fundamental. Yeah. It really is that basic. Like, you know, just this visceral feeling of an inability to exist in mm-hmm. one's own skin. Mm-hmm. And for that to be like, you know, permeating and pervasive and ongoing and i guess that's that's kind of the gist of it well there just until recently there hasn't really been um language for it Mm -hmm. and so a lot of it people like you said they experience most of their lives um me personally as well trying to pin down what that feeling is there's like an absolute deep dread is the closest thing I like that's it's just you can't shake it and um, it, it does very seriously affect your daily life oh absolutely dread and 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 horror yes disgust and, and aversion I mean how are you supposed to form an identity when that's your relationship mm-hmm. with the machine you're living in yes exactly <laughs> yes and then when the machine doesn't align with who you are and your the, the expectations of you socially are mismatched like it's it, it is a it's a shit show 
It's a mess. And, you know, there's clinical language for this stuff and has been for, you know, going on a hundred years, but that doesn't help most people. Yeah, there's no, in the layman's, <laughs> there were no words. And for me, my both my parents were teachers, and but they did not believe in ADHD or autism. They just believed that they were naughty children. Mm. They didn't want to listen. Mm. From the old school. Oh, very much so. <laughs> very much so. And me being AFAB, then of course, there was nothing wrong with me at all. No, like, no, no, because you behaved yourself. Right, of course. Yes, I did. <laughs> and uh, so, like a lot of people, I hear the same, my, I hear my story from other people so often. Like, um, got put in the gifted program, got burnout, got, you know, pushed through pushing through college, pushing through all these other things and we get burnt out and everyone wonders why. Mm. And it's because, you know, um, there's so much going on inside. Like you said, the people who are experiencing um, dysphoria, especially, you know, you have to do a lot of searching yourself and really, really looking at yourself. And because that's the part that a lot of people it's not just one day i decided that oh i think i'm gonna be gay or something you know or, <laughs> like i don't it doesn't work that way it's, it starts when you're little and you start to realize immediately that your skin is not you know like um something i heard earlier was it was between about the age of eight 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 or nine you know people already know usually that they're gender divergent I mean that was when it that but that was when it was like I couldn't avoid it anymore. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then it says but a lot of people don't come out until about you know up to a decade after they realize this about themselves because they don't you you have to go on a soul searching mission. I find it amazing the thought of being able to come out at 18. Yes. That would be that would that would have been amazing. <laughs> as opposed to coming out earlier. No, as opposed to oh. coming out at forty. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's beautiful that people can do that. I wish I I, I think that they should have more support. Yes. I think people should be able to come out whenever they figure it the fuck out. But yes. I will, I will, I will point out that there's a definitely a, a generational shift happening, and it it brings me joy. Yeah. Yes, it's so awesome. To I went to Costco, and there was a young kid working there, and he just hollered at me, I "Like your earrings, boss." Fuck and, yeah. You know, that, that, that was so cool. <laughs> like yeah, the younger bro. generation is just, yeah. <laughs> I love the whole attitude. I, I can dig it. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just thinking about how like in talking to my parents and other people their age, so late 50s and 60s, and talking to them about gender divergence is so difficult. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I gotta hand it to my mom and I I guess also my dad a little bit uh, but I really gotta hand it to my mom for you know trying and trying and trying and like everybody getting mad at her all of the time for not getting it and trying anyway but this is not me this is not me saying oh my gosh sis people we love you so much you did so good um, but it's just it's the way that their brains are wired to think about other people. Or, and maybe it's, you know, the type of person that my mom is and the way that she needs to categorize things. Um, but this, this, they have this need to, like, take a person and put them in a box and, like, label and understand fully. And it's... It's really really gets in the way of their understanding gender truly whereas that it's not something to be understood it's not something to categorize it's not something for you to clock on other people 
it's I don't know she it's these young people that are just taking it in stride um to adjust themselves to be around their peers and um communities more fully and supportive um and they have a much easier time adjusting their worldview because they don't have that everything needs to be in a box because they're fucking tired of boxes themselves and not that they're like trying to burst out of a gender box but they also don't fuck with the boxes anymore so it's much easier for them to throw that shit aside and um get down with get down with the new stuff <laughs> Which says to me that it's not a wiring thing. Yeah. This is socialized, right? And we're talking about a generation that is, like, honestly, some of the most normative folks we've ever had. <laughs> like, ever. Ever in all of human history. The, 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 their parents and baby boomers have this really rigid way that they think the world works and think the world should work. And I'm not sure even their parents' parents were that bad. And I'm definitely not sure that my generation is that bad. Um, Gen X seems like 50-50 split, whether they bought into their yeah. parents' bullshit or not. <laughs> And it's pretty well divided along class lines. Like, if you had the money to buy into your parents' bullshit, you probably did. And if you didn't, well, you're hanging out with millennials and younger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm not, I, I don't think this is hardwiring. I think this is just a handful of really shitty mm -hmm. generations whose attitude has been exported globally, right? This has become the globally dominant mm -hmm. attitude. So it's pervasive and it's oppressive. And if it works for you, I'm sure you have big interest in maintaining it. But if it doesn't work for you, you're in the boat with the rest of us and your feet are probably at least a little closer to plant it on the ground. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. And I think Maybe. when I said like wiring, it, it was word that I was using to describe the idea of, of socialization. So thank you for saying yeah yeah and i mean it's it, that's valid because you do wire your brain when you when you're being mm -hmm. when you're training yourself and when you're being trained yeah, yeah you're wiring your brain it's absolutely but i think it's undone this is also true just when they're when they're when they're 77 and they they're not even interested have no expectations. No, that's why I'm like, come on, you can do it. You can do it. Come on. Get there before your brains turns to mush and I can't get any more in you. I wish you I wish you Godspeed. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily I have two older sisters that are super super supportive, um, that are constantly also having conversations with with our mother that so it's not just me doing all the heavy lifting <laughs> having an advocate yes. is priceless having two advocates is like double priceless half. but uh... <laughs> one okay one and a half <laughs> yeah um no it's really t it's two advocates they they got my back these the generational differences between the ex accepting um new ideas and, and changes to worldviews. I, I feel like it's so easy for, for younger people to just be like, actually, here's this other idea. And they're like, hmm, no, that makes sense. All right, I'm changed. <laughs> you know, I wonder how much of it is just access yeah. to information. 
like th having that be part of your worldview, having the reality that, you know, new information can actually change your worldview yeah. on Twitter. And it happens often Twitter. too. This isn't like every blue moon. Mm -hmm. It's like new information is happening all the time. And if you get used to that experience of having new information either destabilize or maybe shake your mm -hmm. worldview a little bit, that becomes normal. And once your worldview expands sufficiently to encompass new information as it comes in, you stop having this like earth shattering yeah. existential crisis every time you learn something mm -hmm. new about the world. But I can't say that about, about, about boomers, about boomers and their parents' yeah. generation and even early Gen X. That was not necessarily part of their early life experience. And there are a lot of them who are trying very hard to make sure that that's not part of their life experience now. Obviously, boomers' parents are done. You know, the greatest generation is no more. But, like, you know, baby boomers and Gen X seem to struggle real hard with their schemas about the way the world works and how yeah. systems function. And they're like clinging to that to the exclusion of reality, right? And it's really disturbing to have a conversation with somebody like that when you're trying for the, perhaps even just for their benefit to get them to at least acknowledge your lived experience for just a moment, right? Just a moment of clarity. And you're dealing with someone who is in active, consistent denial of reality in mm. other ways. And when they get good at doing that, as you do through a lifetime of practice, they learn how to do that with just about any new information that challenges yeah. their understanding of the systems and the world around them. And I don't know a whole lot of people who are living firmly planted on the ground that can function that way. Like it takes a tremendous amount of privilege to be able to maintain yeah. that position. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the money or you don't have family or you don't have some sort of like societal insulation from the way the world actually works, you kind of can't get away with thinking that way. But there is a whole generation of white people, a generation and a half of white people who can afford mm -hmm. to function this way. And in fact, the system in the systems in which they live were made for them yes. to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> 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 the gaslighting yeah. is real. Anything everybody else can mm -hmm. do. Uh huh. Yeah, you have access to all <laughs> the same stuff that I did when I was your age. Right. Yeah, bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. And so I'm not, we're not even, we're, at this point, we're not even having conversations about, uh, about internal experience, invisible experience. We're talking about like yeah. getting housing and meeting your basic needs and like really tangible mm -hmm. shit with numbers and real people everywhere like it's not hard to substantiate this stuff but you're up against this like wall of of it almost willful yeah. lack of understanding mm -hmm. and their whole social system everyone else around them is doing the same gaslighting like they're all gaslighting themselves and each other and then everyone who comes at them with wait that's not how the world works is like you know obviously an enemy and they have to be wrong they yeah. have to be wrong 
Otherwise, the world isn't what I think it is. Oh, my God. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's how brainwashing works, isn't it, though? It teaches you, you go in those circles. You're thinking, they, they do the circle thing. And I'm like, hold on a second. That's amazing. <laughs> they, they, they come back around the same. And you're like, wow, there's just no, there's no way in. There is no way into that. It's amazing. It's amazing to watch. <laughs> it's terrifying because, like, it means my ability to survive. Like, these people are in control of so many aspects of my life fucking wild to have a fucking crazy person making legislation about you out of whole cloth and you know evicting you from your housing and denying you employment and denying you food etc it's like it it, it, Mm. these are crazy people (laughs) these are crazy people (laughs) crazy cat I'm just trying to maintain a relationship with my mom, but I'm not sure it's really worth it. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> that got me thinking. I, you know, my youngest came out as non-binary at 13, and I didn't really think about what you were just talking about makes complete sense. I mean, for me, like the most challenging thing was just getting used to different pronouns. And the bridge to, for me, to making sense of these different pronouns was, was they, them. And that's just, for me, that was just acknowledging the way it clicked for me was just acknowledging that I don't know. And to go into every situation, assuming that I don't know. And what you're, what you're pointing out is that for, literally billions of people to be able to acknowledge that they don't know is an impossibility because they've got even if it's complete and utter bullshit they've got these systems that are completely very well defined and they their entire worldview relies on those bullshit structures it's (sighs) it's worse it's worse than that there is a basic level of intelligence necessary to know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. There is also a literal minimum IQ threshold for (laughs) being able to reason in the abstract and it's not low. Mm. (laughs) This is a bad combination. Mm -hmm. and it's real and the problem is that we're talking about a huge percentage of the population like Mm -hmm. really big percentage of the population who are incapable of abstract reasoning in the first place (gasps) and who don't (gasps) know what they don't know Mm -hmm. those are scary ass people yeah, but they're everywhere and they're in charge of everything because it's not yeah. unusual. <laughs> it's not odd. It's not weird at all. It's terrifying. But it's really difficult to test and we can't discriminate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But wow and Mm -hmm. bear that in mind when you're talking to people when you're reading the news about decisions made when when you are dealing with people keep that in mind it It simply does not cringe (laughs) (laughs) like it it just makes me cringe so what about um you know some of the difficulties in getting health care because of who's in charge. Um, like AFAB people really have trouble getting hysterectomies mm-hmm. sometimes because, um, you know, said people in charge 
her like well what about, what your, about your husband capabilities <laughs> what are, what about the thing that i don't have uh, and don't want and like, don't no. care about and it's the and and cis women are are subject to exactly the same yes bullshit. like yes. It, it does it, yes. it's, it's the worst if you have a uterus you will encounter this and i'm like take the baby box out we don't like it well and the thing is like <laughs> first of all you sh as far as i'm concerned you should be able to have that done electively this is a this should mm -hmm. be an, an an informed consent procedure <clears throat> second like you know the 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 super fashy shit that that gives rise to to all of that like it is super fashy like no 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 you you need you need to we need to keep you fertile you need to give birth for the state and i'm like uh, no. <laughs> no, no but also like say say you have endometriosis and this thing is the bane of your existence have it out be done with it be done with it when you're 18 don't wait until you're 45 live your life free from disability have it mm -hmm. out this should not be a big deal, but, but the fash, but the fash. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's something that I'm personally having trouble with because there's nothing wrong with my uterus. I don't, I town? don't need it taken out. I'm in Eugene. I have some referrals for you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. I need your uterus taken out. Okay. Get out our friend Nate. <laughs> I I I can I can hook you up with a guy. Yeah, he's with he's actually guy. he's actually my neighbor. It's kind of wild. <laughs> That's great. Uh, it's it's funny it. and it also like it also brings up the vibes of like coat hanger abortions, you know, that like not at all the same thing, but it's like th that we have to like connect our folks to other people who won't give them a fucking hard time about this super simple thing that should be given a hard time about. Mm -hmm. Not at all the same thing. Very different, but like <laughs> <laughs> yeah but the diy you know and and mutual aid aspect of these kind of mm -hmm. communities yeah. is necessary i mean there isn't public support and even if the resources exist there are these you know little out of the way secrets and for good reason right like they wouldn't want to be too public yeah. about what they do you know, you don't necessarily want to uh, attract attention to yourself as a clinic that provides gen gender affirming care in a political yeah. environment like this. So, you know, I get I get why things are the way they are. They're just completely fucking unacceptable. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's why we're all here. Isn't it, it is indeed. It is. Indeed. Do our little parts that we can to be more visible and and be like hey world this is we're not going to be quiet about i this. i love that that existing has become a political <laughs> act mm -hmm. <laughs> i i did it's, not necessarily you know, anticipate that that was going to be part of my midlife yeah back in 2008 when i got my vasectomy mm -hmm. as a cis white presenting guy they gave me a hard my doctor gave me a hard time about getting a vasectomy well you weren't right old after. enough to make that decision at like, what 30 the hell? whatever <laughs> i was like i had four fucking kids at that point i mean i'm fucking done i'm done i was i should have been done years ago <laughs> but that was also something i wanted to talk about <clears throat> just how even for cis people how having health care whether it's you know physical or mental health care being so heavily gendered negatively impacts people i mean it, it's severe and in some ways it, it distorts the health care pretty heavily itself you know like for instance you were we were talking recently you were talking about um, 
you were making a case for um, BPD and narcissistic personality disorder potentially being one and the same, but you know, heavily gendered versions of um, essentially the same thing. Sure. Sure. And, and the mention of, you know, the difficulty diagnosing, uh, ADHD and autism in, in, uh, femme presenting children because of gendered behavior expectations, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It crops up everywhere. Mm -hmm. It, it's shocking that, that right-leaning cis people can't acknowledge the negative impact of this this heavily gendered society. I mean, like, well, again, we're back to it, people who don't reason in the abstract. Well, right. Mm -hmm. So unless this happens to you, if you are incapable of abstract reasoning, you are also incapable of the empathy necessary to see how this can affect other people's material conditions. Right. And so you, like you you have this feeling in the back of your mind and you don't want to think this about people because it's really ungenerous but you have this feeling that people who subscribe to heavily conservative ideologies aren't particularly smart and if if this if this study holds true that you know there really is like you really do have to have an IQ of at least 80 to reason in the abstract, you mm -hmm. may actually have a a, a nice ready-made red <laughs> flag there, like a nice like label. Are you capable of abstract reasoning in so far as it's necessary to have yeah. empathy? Do you have enough imagination? <laughs> To have empathy and to understand how various decisions and systems and processes yeah. affect other living things. Yes, there no. could be a small range there, but and, it couldn't be a particularly vast range of empathy to extend. Or no range. I don't know. I worry about these people. <laughs> <laughs> I worry about these people. Just in on the whole, in general. <laughs> yeah. It makes me think of the few family members that my sisters and I don't really talk to anymore because first multiple reasons, but like we just got to the point where we're like I'm like we're done arguing about these things because in like in order for there to be a point in arguing with you there has you have to there ha, there there must be a goal or a, a, like an idea that you can get to the other side and I am not seeing that with the way you're <laughs> unable to be creative and empathize with these very complex and abstract issues. You simply lack that cognitive function to, uh, wh what was it? Abstract, abstract, abstract reasoning. reasoning. You're simply lacking the abstract reasoning needed to extend this empathy to people affected in, in, in these issues that we talk about. And so what's the point in yelling and screaming with you anymore? <laughs> like, uh... Uh, I mean that, that that also is a fair question because some people don't necessarily have the same goal in mind no. during discourse uh, it may be that arriving at shared understanding is not in fact this person's goal <laughs> I kind of went I, like, listen my family is very competitive and I've been trying very hard in my life to take that out of not take it out of myself but control it in ways that sort of, yeah be aware <laughs> of it yeah um yeah no conversations are to be won not <laughs> right 
Yeah, I, I mentioned that because uh, that's a theme in, in discussions mm -hmm. with my mother. Uh, for her, conversations are not actually things that you have to be able to, you know, share yeah. experiences or arrive at mutual understanding. They are opportunities to um, try to win the floor and, you know be be and direct a conversation and and be in be in charge be important make make the most points of the conversation be heard be listened to yeah so i'll always examine what your conversation partner's yeah. motives are because like at some point <laughs> you're wasting your own breath to like you're just going to escalate yourself just stay impossible. comfortable protect yourself I mean, unless unless that's your thing, unless you enjoy engaging with people that way, and then you know, I, I, hey, I, there's lots of people out there that are willing to 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 mm -hmm. talk with you like that. But that is absolutely no. not my bag. I am not into that scene. <laughs> I want nothing to do with that. So, like, unless you're actually prepared to, you know, have mm -hmm. a back and forth and maybe try to arrive yeah. at a location. I, I don't really nah I'm good <laughs> I come out of a conversation I'm like good. that when I can feel myself starting to get like activated <clears throat> at like I don't know once I pass like a five I'm like ooh okay um, I'm getting mm -hmm. warning signs mm -hmm. that I need to back out of this mm -hmm. we all have all kinds uh -huh. of triggers and you know they don't they don't have to be like you know major trauma triggers we all have all kinds of behavioral sure, triggers and when you start seeing those those buttons get pushed and those those li mm -hmm. those lights light up might be time to walk away <laughs> mm -hmm. yes, sir. yes time to get yeah i had to uh, i had to walk out on christmas mm -hmm. dinner this year big shock you know shocking mm -hmm. and uh unfortunately you know you're still you're, you're still probably mm -hmm. the villain uh civility politics being as as popular as they are um if 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 you do it wrong it doesn't even really matter how composed yeah. you remain as you're walking out the yeah. door you did it wrong yeah and therefore, your message, whatever your message may have been, is completely invalid because you are a horrible human being. So I'm not saying you're going to win, even if you <laughs> walk away. <laughs> it always feels like a defeat after something, after you've, you've been, you've shown your emotions and you got heated. You feel defeated and like why do i even fucking try why what was the i feel like an idiot for losing my cool in there i would say that if you feel that way it was probably a trap <laughs> if you feel that way it was probably Ooh. a trap okay <laughs> yeah and you know if one has a choice one does not maintain relationships mm -hmm. in which that dynamic exists but you know for most of us we're talking yeah. about family and we grow up thinking that our family and our community is absolutely integral to our mm -hmm. to our survival and this is true, like this, this has adaptive value. This is evolutionary psychology, yes. And of course, you know, if you are in any way socioeconomically disadvantaged, that is very real. If you are estranged from your family, you are immediately subject to, you know, the effects yeah. of poverty. So, like, we stay in these relationships even though they're not just non-productive, they're, mm -hmm. they're draining, they are, they're harmful, but it's, that's all we have. That's our support system, as we see it, right? Until we form something different. 
And that is more or less difficult for any given individual, depending on their level of privilege, disadvantage, yeah. or disability. So it's easy for one to lay out the platitudes, you know, oh, well, uh, chosen family is always better and, you know, every, you just need to let go of these mm -hmm. toxic relationships. But, you yeah. know, that's, that, that, that's, a, that, that's easier said than done. And that's a whole ass fucking mm -hmm. life journey. <laughs> mm -hmm. Don't tell me to just do that right now. And that's a plunge <laughs> off of a cliff. How am I just going to just do that? <laughs> well, I mean, no. you're not willingly. You're not willingly unless something necessitates it. It's not a thing you're going to do because it's it's not a it, it's not a risk that anyone really mm -hmm. wants to take or should yeah. have to take. But, you know, sometimes you get a sometimes you get a pat on the back that sends you off the cliff <laughs> I, have been, mm -hmm. I have been the pat on the back not in a traumatic way but i have been the pat on the back that was like i got you man like we're gonna jump off this cliff and it's gonna be okay like we're that's that's better than the pat oh. on the back <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. it was more like holding hands we'll jump together that's cool that's that, yeah. that, that, that's legit that shit is tough yeah, and you're not going to do it until it's the last straw, the last resort, like, you are forced to do so. Yeah, I mean, it can take years mm -hmm. to let go of certain ties. And it can take a lot of reinforcement. Like, sometimes you just have to be <laughs> yeah. reminded enough times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go back for Christmas dinner or whatever. And you're like, yeah, this is why I haven't been yeah. here since last year. Well, <laughs> sometimes you just need enough reminders. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think this was a great talk. Um, it was a great chance to yeah. get to know you. And I'd love to have you on again. I am available. I am available at various <laughs> intervals. We'll catch you on one of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That was our talk with Nate Lundeen. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Subspace Exploration Project. Every episode, you can join us for a plunge into kink, non-monogamy, sex education, deconstructing the gender binary, queer culture, and building healthy communities. Please comment, like, share, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Acast, and RSS.